Okay. We're good? All right. Should we get started? I think we start at one, right? Okay. Um, it's nice to see everybody. This is the talk that I'll be giving, so just make sure you're in the right place. Room 324, <laughs> Creating Nimble Drupal Systems for Government, Transforming Minnesota's Department of Health in Six Months. I'm excited to be doing this in live, in real person, with lots of people around again, so this is great. All right, here's an agenda. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction, who I am, who we are as 10.7, then kind of why are we here, what's this story actually about, try to define what nimble Drupal systems are, and then talk about the six months of transform transformation that we think MDH had. Um, in the blurb of the talk, I talked about a secret sauce, and so I'll go through what I think that is, how you can use it too. Um, and then asking for help is often hard to do. Some thoughts about that, and then I'll leave it open for Q&A at the end. All right, hello. Here's a picture of me, just like Haley did earlier. Don't know why there's a picture of me with me standing right here, but there is a recording, so maybe that's, that's the useful part. Um, my name is Ivan Segic. I live here in Minneapolis. I have a background in physics and in research and development. I used to be at Honeywell and animation. I wrote some software as well, but I've been tinkering with Drupal since about 2007. So I had my hand up when it was Drupal 5 in the earlier presentation, did not have any experience with 4.7, and I kind of started 10.7 in, inadvertently. Sort of did it by mistake, burned out at a company, and then played a lot with Drupal, and then someone decided to pay me, <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> so when Tiffany asks, has Drupal changed your life, it's definitely changed mine. Started a company as a result, and um, have worked with huge number of amazing people that I hope their lives have been changed as well. And now I serve as CEO at 10.7. 10.7, we are fully remote since 2017, so pre-pandemic, values driven, web design and Drupal development agency, and we're headquartered here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Our mission is to make things that matter we use this as the lens that guides our work, and I know a lot of people talk about their mission, but this truly is something we use to try to figure out the kinds of projects we want to work with, the kind of people we want to work with, the kind of good we want to do in the world. But what does that mean in reality with the clients that we have? No one should go hungry. We work with Second Harvest Heartland. That's definitely square with our mission. We work with Sage Glass. Where they believe in smarter, greener construction. Inclusive, powerful engagement with history. Minnesota Historical Society is a client of ours. They're running a Drupal 10 site, mnhs.org. Peaceful co-parenting with Our Family Wizard. The marketing site there is a Drupal 10 site as well. We do love the Animal Humane Society, so to help animals. They've been a client of ours since 2008. Their first site was a Drupal 5 site, so long time uh, Drupal believers as well. Make things that matter also means to end wrongful convictions to us. We've built things for the Innocence Project. And we also work with Three Rivers Park District. And to us, make things that matter also promotes environmental stewardship. And so all of these things come together to influence and to help us think about the work we do, even um, you know, everyday interactions. We try to live those. So why are we here today? What's the story about? Well, this is a story of how we helped a closely knit team inside a state government department transform their existing Drupal site and the things connected to it. And I think the words here are sort of the most important ones. We helped a team inside government transform their Drupal site. And honestly, if you take away the government part, we really just helped a team transform their Drupal site, an existing site they had. And so this isn't just applicable to government, it's applicable to other industries and other organizations that might have an existing site, that have a team that are working on it, that maybe need some help. And the, the department we're talking about is the Department of Health at the uh, state of Minnesota. 
And their mission is to protect, maintain, and improve the health of all Minnesotans. Kind of important when there's a pandemic going on. So definitely something that resonates with us um, and was an incredible opportunity for us to work with. Um, I think all presentations are required to have a screenshot of the site. So this is what the site looks like right now. What does transform mean to you? And what did it mean to the Minnesota Department of Health? Uh, did it mean faster to load? Did it mean easier to navigate? Easier to update? More secure? Better SEO? Does transform mean faster to deploy or nicer to look at? More accessible? Or is it something else? I really think that improvement is a continuum and that it involves conscious work and conscious iteration and that when you put all of these improvements of very many things together, you get transformation. So transformation, in my opinion, is the improvement of all the things or as many of the things you can possibly improve across a spectrum on a site. And when we look at the title of the talk, that's sort of where the transformation part comes in, is the second half of the title, right? What are all the things that we can do to transform the site from something that you might not recognize even after it's done? But it's this part, the nimble Drupal systems, that I want to define because it's, um, I hope it's not clickbaity. It's not supposed to be clickbaity. It's supposed to describe the kind of things that we're striving for. So nimble Drupal systems, what do I mean by that? So let's define some things. I think I missed, yeah, there we go. Uh, nimble, quick and light in action. And there's the word agile there as well. So I didn't highlight that one. It just so happens to be part of the, the definition. But in my mind, something that's nimble is also flexible. It's fast, it's light, but there's some sort of action associated with it. And then just as a reminder, what's a system? A system is a set of related things. They obviously make up a whole. You can kind of collect them together to do the thing you need it to do. So nimble Drupal systems are quick, light, Drupal-related things that work together as a whole. And honestly, they can be anything you want them to be. So they could be a taxonomy, a bunch of tags, and the the thought you put around how those things are related to each other hierarchically. They could be composer files and YAML files and the way that your local system is set up to do development on the Drupal site. Um, and so when I say nimble Drupal systems, I mean things that work together and are somehow Drupal related. So let's look at the six months of transformation. What's the secret sauce? Let me take a step back and, and just kind of describe where we started with the Department of Health. We essentially had MDH come to us and say, hey, we need some Drupal support. Can you help? <laughs> and of course, we were delighted by that question um, because yes, of course we can help. Um, but the first step is always asking. And the second step for us as an organization is always to lead with empathy. And that's the secret sauce, in my opinion. That's the lens that we use at 10.7 and the things we do. So once there's a request that's come in, we want to be mindful of the work we're going to do and we want to be able to do it with empathy. So what did the first month look like with the Department of Health in these six months of transformation? Well, we had a kickoff, we got started, we hit the ground running, right, Kelly? Uh, of course. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's nice. not what happened. <laughs> of course you remember what happened. Um, we had a contract and a statement of work we had to get through. We had to get legal things out of the way. It always, 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 always takes longer than you expect. Um, and one of our values is be mindful. And that filters into our promise to lead with empathy you want to plan for that additional time. Yes, the folk at the Department of Health want to get running as quickly as we do, 
that's not always possible. Sometimes there are roadblocks, like access to things, and permissions, and credentials, and multi-factor authentication, and VPNs, and getting the right account at the state set up so that you can access those things. There's all of these items that you have to do. And you have to do these things with the lens of empathy. And then finally, you can have that kickoff. Um, and that took about a month. And I, I want to point this out because we'll, we're all eager to get the work done. We want to do the work. We want to help. And the clients that have asked for the help in some cases, it's taken a long time to get to the ability to even be able to ask. And so we want to be mindful and remember that, but we always want to plan for that additional time. And so here we have a team that asked us for help. We spent about a month getting to the kickoff. We got everything in place, and then we start learning things about the Department of Health. This was their team's first Drupal site. They literally built this site from scratch on their own. Mm -hmm. They migrated it from previously cold fusion that they had to go to this thing called Lucy that I don't even know what it is, but it's like some other, maybe it's a public supported version of cold fusion. Mm -hmm. And then they moved it all into this Drupal site that they also had to pause their work on because guess what, the pandemic hit. And they eventually launched it in 2022. And so from our perspective, we want to be mindful of that. Like, They poured their you know, years into this migration. And the secret sauce is to remember to listen to that and to have empathy for that. Because this is their baby, right? You can't come in and start just telling them how it should be. You have to be empathetic to that. So what did the second month or so look like? It's a lot of listening on our part, a lot of learning, a lot of discovering. We spend a lot of time talking to them. We get walkthroughs. We look at what their infrastructure is like, how it's set up. They discover things they didn't know. We discover things that <laughs> we didn't know. And we remember the value that we have, which is be a team. We're all in this together. They're discovering, we're discovering. And in the second month, we start to do audits. And we do three main audits. We do a technical audit, we do a UX audit, and we do an accessibility audit. And we're mindful here of the things that we're doing because who likes to show off their stuff and be audited? Nobody does. The technical audit, I'll get through some of the details of each of these. Um, but the technical audit looked at the infrastructure as well as the setup of the Drupal, as well as the workflow and how code gets to the live site. User experience is sort of the front end stuff, the not necessarily the design, but the navigation and the hierarchy of the content model. And of course, accessibility. Um, we all want the sites to be as accessible as possible. And of course, there are always access issues. So even though we set up things in the first month and we thought we had access, maybe not everybody had access. Maybe the people that had access didn't have the access they needed to. So let's continue to lead with ep empathy. And towards the, sec the end of the second month, we had recommendations. Reports, priorities, a roadmap, um, and most importantly, the luxury to do iteration. We knew that we knew where we had to get to, we knew we wanted to transform this site in a series of continual iterative improvements. It was the ability to, to and the luxury to be able to get there in steps that I think was um, very important to us. So a reminder that empathy is a muscle that only gets stronger with every use. So the more you do it, the easier it is to do. And if you can get anything from this talk today is that the more empathy you can have for your teammates and for your clients and for everyone around you that you're working with, the better off you're going to be and the better off they're going to be. So for the remaining four months, we slowly improved many little things. We tried to use our secret sauce in every line of code, in every meeting, and in every interaction we had. And in those four months, there was one thing that we absolutely did that we um, 
could not have done without is we had chickens. They were regular, we didn't miss them, and we recorded them if that was possible. Uh, recording things is is um, you can some people will say, oh, it's Big Brother leadership is looking after looking out to see what you're doing. Uh, they're checking to see that you're doing the work. That is not the intention. The intention that we look at it. Um, the lens that we look at it through is through a lens of abundance. We want to record all of these things so that we can all learn from the things that we're doing. Um, it is by no means big brother. Um, and at the same time, we want to be using tools that work for everyone. Tools that um, reduce the amount of friction that exists between partners, between clients, um, and agencies. And although we may like Zoom, and we may have liked Vowel before that, that some of you maybe have heard of, probably all of you have not heard of, that didn't work for MDH. They preferred to use Teams. We did that. Um, maybe we didn't get as many recordings as we would have liked, but it's important to have used that empathy and to have used the tools that work for our client. The other thing that we were regular and um, consistent with is keeping good notes and make sure that they were accessible to everyone. It's these little improvements that work towards a giant transformation. The other thing that we were keenly aware of was the fact that MDH is hosted at, M at uh, AWS. Um, they're internally managed through a group of their own. Um, they loved the fact that they can do that. They manage and host many other applications at MDH. The website is just one additional thing they do. So there are very strict security requirements, especially from Minit, the IT part of the state of Minnesota. And that's actually a good thing. It's a good thing because it forces you to do DevOps in a best practices sort of way. But we're all used to Pantheon and Acquia, and so where is my web UI, and where are my environments, and where are all the things I can do with Pantheon when you're hosting it um, in an environment that, is, that maybe doesn't have that? And so what we did was we tried to bring those best practices to MDH by making sure we can have multi-developer, multi-branch work that was consistent both locally and in a staging environment without going or running afoul of any of the security requirements. So yeah, we weren't able to push to the production site. There was still a ticket required. There were still internal processes that needed to be followed. But we could very easily get to a staging environment. We were able to optimize that whole DevOps pipeline so that we could make changes locally and create a branch and see it in a staging environment. That was good enough, and that's OK. And what I wanted to say in this last bullet here, these are all still Drupal systems. Yes, there is Composer, and yes, it's AWS, but they're all fundamentally powering a Drupal site, and they're all fundamentally part of the Drupal work that you do. So let's talk a little bit about the technical Drupal systems implementation that we did, and how these little improvements help to bring along the, the larger transformation. Well, I'm going too fast. Okay. So we updated their build pipeline while still keeping with the minute security requirements. I already mentioned that. My finger is not working. OK. Um, we retired their Bitnami image in favor of, a light, of lighter, more performant containers. Bitnami was a container they chose because that was what was out there. It seemed like it would do a good job, and it did. I mean, they, they had a powered site in AWS. We were able to bring something that was lighter and faster and allow, allowed for more collaboration. Um, and we did that knowing that they wanted to scale at AWS just like they scale all their other apps while still keeping the idea that there should be developers that can work on this stuff locally. We also went through their Drupal implementation and reduced the number of languages, scripts, and generally did a deep clean. The the uh, distribution of Drupal that they had selected had a whole bunch of stuff that maybe didn't need to be there. So we helped them figure that out. And then there was this major file migration that was a huge number of PDFs that were part of this Cold Fusion site previously 
on an old server that weren't managed. They were not file managed in Drupal at all. So we had to write a migration that got that into the Drupal system so that everybody was happy. Um, and then as part of these Drupal system implementations, we kept very partic uh, meticulous notes, um, made sure that we had documentation that was accessible, try to write down everything you do. Um, it's a way of being inclusive. And also as part of the um, improvements that we brought to the table, we fixed some unknown uh, or un unseen security risks that they had. So not just Drupal updates. So not just Drupal updates, but other things that were maybe a risk that weren't noted that, that we were able to pick up. So all of these are examples of tiny things that come together that are quick light systems working together so that Drupal can shine from a code perspective. And of course, it was more than just code that we did. We had a UX systems implementation as well. Based on some research, we decided to suggest sticky search elements, which we implemented. We created custom blocks to standardize call to actions globally. So instead of having to change a call to action on every single page where that call to action shows up, we moved these CTAs to blocks that we dropped on, in on pages so that you can change it in one place and it changes ever, everywhere. All, of why, all while remembering that you should have empathy for the people that built this originally who never built a Drupal site before, didn't know that blocks were a thing and could be deployed in this way. <clears throat> we updated the way that they used the accordion and then we aligned their font usage across the site to match their brand standards. And we also fixed some hierarchical things in, um, in the headings and in the way that um, the information was laid out. And all of these things are done in a way that you're hitting Drupal, but you're also doing UX work. And so in my mind, this is an okay thing to call a Drupal system. We also looked at their content moderation strategy. And um, you want to point out that content moderation is very hard. Um, you probably all know that. Um, it's a human problem, and it requires a human solution. And we want to be inclusive in the way we think about these things. We've seen things in the past in previous implementations where maybe the problem was changed so that it would fit a Drupal module in a way that the Drupal module exists. Instead of looking to see what the actual problem was and trying to make the Drupal system, whether it's a module or new code or a combination of UX, work to solve the human problem. And so we did that. Um, we, we didn't change the problem. We deployed the Drupal system so that it would address the moderation problem. We also did workshops. We had a tag strategy workshop. Um, did an inventory of their tags. <laughs> there were a lot of tags. <laughs> there were thousands of tags. <laughs> and all the tags were on one surface. They were all flat. Um, but we went from 1,000 to less than 100. I'm guessing it was less than 100. Was it less than 100? OK, we'll go with less than 100. <laughs> uh, Aaron worked on it, so. Um. We also optimized the tags, right? So previously, anybody could add a tag at any time, which is why there were thousands of tags. Um, in one case, we switched to using primary and secondary tags, and we shut down the ability to add primary tags and we added moderation to the secondary tags. So there, was a, there wasn't a um, sort of a, you shall not have tags. There was a, <laughs> let's fix this. Let's listen to what the human problem is. Let's, let's in, uh, iterate on this and change it incrementally so that it's better for you. And we moderated access, like I said, to the secondary tags. We also moved the site away from a single basic content type that basically required you to do manual updates on the pages uh, everywhere. 
Um, and of course, it's always better to have content types that are designed for the kind of content that you intend to uh, be publishing, like news types. And then we spent a fair amount of time on accessibility. We did an audit of the production site. We were living our values of be mindful and be inclusive for the user, the user that's using the site as a citizen of the state of Minnesota or anyone else, but also for the administrator too. I mean, can you imagine how hard it is to manage a thousand tags in the Drupal CMS? Not very easy. So when we did the audit, we kept that in mind as well. And then we, ish we categorized each of the issues that we came up with into critical and non-critical items. Kind of makes sense to do that. And then we addressed the critical ones and worked on the non-critical ones as we were able to. And so this part, this Drupal system that affected the accessibility of the site, kind of a configuration. So for example, um, to get better WCAG compliance, we might make some uh, fields required for alt tags so that you can't just save an image or um, upload something and not provide something that a screen reader could use. All of these small incremental minor optimizations come together to transform the site. Um, and of course, we also fine tuned image settings and clarity of those images. Everybody knows how hard it is to get those right. Sometimes they're too big, sometimes they're too small. Sometimes someone decides to upload a 100 megabyte picture of, uh, <laughs> of something that you really shouldn't be doing. So there's ways to, to change that, and we did. All of that to say that in those six months, we were able to do many small things to bring about a complete transformation of the site. Um, and I think the hardest, not about the hardest part, but part of that was asking for help. So I'm very grateful that we were able to have this uh, project and this partnership with MDH. Um, it is quite often hard to do when you're asking for help. Sometimes it's easy if you're, um, if you're really sinking. Um, but what would prevent someone from asking for help? Um, maybe it didn't even occur to you that you could do that. Um, the more eyes we have on something, the more we involve the community, the better off we are. Um, I would be embarrassed to show my code. That's why I don't ask for help. Let's lead with empathy. We've all been there. It's okay. We've all written bad code. It's just hard to ask for help. Yep. Can I even afford it? Probably, if it's just an audit engage engagement, you can probably afford it. You can go back and make the changes you need to. You don't need a six-month um, engagement. Um, it's just so bad. We just need a new site. You probably don't. Like, it's nice to start from scratch, but you've invested so much time and effort and knowledge into the site you have. Why throw it away? Um, there's likely a lot you can do that you don't even know about. Um, and then my favorite one is bureaucracy, RFP. Uh, there's actually ways to figure this out as well. So don't let that stop you from asking for help. And that's the end. And I'll leave it there for any questions. Let me just put a thank you up. Thanks to everyone for attending, all the volunteers that make this happen. Um, and also to the Drupal community at large. Obviously, my life would be very different if it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. That was a question? Um, yeah, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, um, you talked about your technical audit, and we're kind of at a place right now where we've had our site for eight years, mm. and we know that there's lots of Cruft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we want to clean that up because we, we look at that question, should we just start from scratch? Mm. And we decided, no, nope, we're not going to do that, but we need to, so we need to do this audit. Um, and I'm particularly interested, I understand how to do content audit. I don't really know how to do that technical audit of Drupal stuff. 
Yeah. Like, do you have tools or things that you use, or is it really just going through and like <laughs> inventorying your fields and your you know, all that? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, when we do a technical audit, we rely on Tess. She's she's <laughs> our. <laughs> Okay, so, need so you need you need tests. Um, <laughs> quite honestly, it's a multifaceted way of doing the audit. So there are tools that we use, there are tools that Tess uses to sort of bring up the um, very high level and also sometimes very low level stuff. But it's the amount of experience that we bring to the table, that Tess brings to the table, that really is able to get at the things that your site might need to change, might need to drop, things that are security issues that maybe a tool didn't pick up. Um, we've detected security intrusions in before that no one has ever seen and we were able to mitigate those. Um, so it, it kind of, it takes a human to do it. It takes some time. Um, when we do something like that, we do sort of a once over from the top to the bottom. So it's not just looking at what version of Drupal is installed? Where is it installed? What PHP version is it? What the, how many content types are there? How is the site configured? What admin theme is being used? But we also look at this hosting environment, um, whether there are Docker images in the repository so that people can do their own local development. What does the um, DevOps look like? Is there a build pipeline? All of the underlying uh, technical stuff gets um, evaluated in addition to the Drupal stuff. That's why I kind of like saying Drupal system because it's the Drupal thing, but it's also all the systems around it. Um, and usually there's a comprehensive report that we'll present to you and go through in a very kind way so that we're not sending you a PDF with a bunch of jargon, <laughs> um, which who wants that? Um, is there anything you want to add? Another thing that's kind of difficult to do, uh, quantify with a lot of audits is the social component that Drupal developers tend to fall into patterns um, depending on their experience levels. And if you work with enough Drupal <coughs> sites for enough, long, uh, enough of a time, you can construct a social picture of what the site is. And when you can do that, you can actually find more potential issues or why some things were done the way that it was done. And that also goes into the audit report because you do need to consider that aspect as well. And I'd say that the technical audit is fine to do on its own, but it's good to do, uh, I'd say, sort of sidecar audits so that you can tell what the um, social interaction and what the workflows are of the people that are actually using the site as well. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, earlier when you were talking about the migration from ProFusion, <laughs> so are they from uh, Micromedia or uh, Adobe? Because I'm assuming they're in Dreamweaver when you migrated. So how did you handle that process? So we did not do the migration. Oh. We, when we started working with MDH, they had a fully launched Drupal site that was live. Um, they did that migration. They created the original Drupal site that we helped with, okay. which is why that slide is so amazing. Like this is a first time internal state of Minnesota, let's build a Drupal site based on a cold fusion site that was now antiquated. So I, I can't speak to like what that migration looked like, but I do know they had to go from cold fusion to, I think it's pronounced Lucy. We're in the same boat, so I'm from Minda. We also use Dreamweaver. We're not in Confusion. We don't use Confusion, but you know, so, it's from Dreamweaver to Drupal, and we're migrating. So you should talk to Andrew Will okay. Holmberg at MDH. Okay. Um, I can connect you with him. I'm sure, sure you know who yeah, he is. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And then, um, so, yeah. sorry, follow up question. Of course. So, uh, so since you help them plan and design the site, is there anything that you wish you had known, like, you know, if you redo this whole process again, that will save you time or you think it will work out better? You know, like, any um, strategy, content? Yeah, I think generally the thing I wish I'd known before working with the state of Minnesota, yeah. um, because honestly the state of Minnesota is the first large state that we've been working with, was that 
it takes a long time to do anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can anticipate yeah. that and plan for it, mm -hmm. and you're okay with that, yeah. that's fine. Um, yeah, I, and then when you know that and you can have empathy for that, you can, it can work out. So it's just filling the time to... The yeah, okay. yeah, I fill right. that in. Because there's a, my, um, my experience has been that um, it takes a long time because the people and the humans at the state have a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. yep. The website is not the only thing that Dave is responsible for. He's responsible for another 100 apps. And the more we can help him sort of not think about the website, the better off he's going to be. Um, okay. So. I'm here just because I wanted to see how you pulled it off in six months, because I'm from the DPTR, and you know, working as a CSD, just a just bureaucracy, the timeline, the number of people, the number of approvals that things have to go through, and it's like, okay, I want to see how this guy did it. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> we did it. Oh, thank you. It wasn't me. I just get to report it all. It's Kelly and Tess and Aaron. And, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you have any insight into why Drupal was chosen? So it's like, why did they jump in and build this Drupal site? Um, I think open source had a big deal with it. I mean, I think the state of Minnesota wants to open, to own all of the things that they make. Um, I think there are a lot, uh, a number of proprietary systems at the state that um, are challenging, um, that maybe have become legacy that are hard to support. So I think that was a, um, a big push. Um, and I think the community as well is another reason why they chose it. Like, there's a large community of developers, not just in the U.S., but in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I think that makes it a good case to be used for that as well. And I will say, um, I'm speaking for Andrew and Kristen at MDH in maybe a way I shouldn't be speaking, and I, I would not like to be able to say the same thing for all the other departments, because I'm sure there are other reasons not to choose Drupal that they've used. So. Follow up to that, maybe. How did they determine that they needed help? You know, you see so many sites out there that are like really screwed up, but they don't know it or something. You know, like how did they decide to come to you? I think that um, both Kristen and Dave um, just are those kinds of self-aware people that mm -hmm. realize that they need the help and that they're not, you know they're going to need to look elsewhere to do that. Very lucky yeah. for everybody. Yeah. Lucky for everybody. <laughs> do you have any insight as to how long it took them to do? their portion yeah. of the project yeah. before coming to you? Um, they didn't know what they were going to do with us. So they didn't really have any prep work to do. They kind of came to us and said, we need help, help us. Um, and so the work that we did was sort of defining what that help would be look, what that help would look like, what the first couple months, that's kind of how we spent the first couple months. I was um, thinking more of how long it took them to do their project up. Oh. From their beginning. Mm -hmm. So, correct, I'm not exactly 100% sure, but my understanding is they started the migration before COVID. Um, all the brand work and design work was done, I think, in 2019. And then in 2020, they had to pause because there were other things to do. Mm -hmm. And then they sort of worked on it for a while and then launched it in 2022. So, it was a, it was my understanding is it was a three year project, thereabouts, that they had to pause on. Um, and also had to, I guess, relearn stuff when they picked it up. Did you help them with the thing or the design, template design? No, we were sort of... So they have that yeah. before, okay. Yeah. When we started working with them, they had a launched site mm -hmm. that so was live. Did you do any redesign? We did not do any redesign. Um, okay. We did some content model work and helped them with their navigation, um, ah. helped them with their content types and so on. There's still a lot to do. I'm curious what kind of content moderation, or you talk, you mentioned content moderation strategy, like what did they implement or can you say something about it? Um, I know they had, I think, 75 editors. Um, there was no module that we installed to implement any kind of workflow, as far as I know. Um, the details, the answer to that I'm going to say I don't know. Kelly might know, so I'm going to put Kelly on the spot for a <laughs> sec. If you don't know, you can say I don't know, but... Um, I do, I know we implemented um, 
like revisions or just moderation um, for so that a contributor could not publish that a, that an editor had published. But as far as further content strategy, I know when they did their migration, all the content ended up in basic pages. Yeah. So we've been working with them section by section to kind of identify those content types that they may need that would bring more organization and kind of a broader structure and then be able to leverage views and different ways to display content across our site so that it's more automatic. They are, a lot of the pages are just lists of links that they have to manually manage themselves and maintain. So trying to bring that efficiency and automation to their site where we can. There's still a lot of work to be done, um, but that's, for me, the exciting part is trying to bring more of that structure and ease of management to their site. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how, how big a site? So how many pages? And then how many uh, contrib modules were we using as well? Uh. <laughs> I did not speak to the contrib modules. I can't tell you the exact number of pages, but it is a site that literally has a page for every illness and disease yeah. you can imagine. So it's a very deep site. I would guess thousands of pages. I would say, yeah, around there, but I don't know under the hood what modules they're they're using. Um, you might remember. It did not seem overgrown, would be how okay. I would characterize it. Right. They had a reasonable number of modules for the kind of site that it was. In fact, slightly less than what I expected. Mm -hmm. So pretty good, good actually. So, uh, 100 <laughs> or 150? What's reasonable? Um, what's reasonable is outside of core and what comes with a, Dru a default Drupal install is somewhere under 100 for me. Yeah. And if it's above that, that's starting to make me worried. Yeah. If you're getting into 300 and more, you're going to end up on my audit report. <laughs> Don't be on that list. Don't be on that list. <laughs> <laughs> Big sticker on it. <laughs> Any other questions? Hmm. Nope. Oh, yes. Any tips to like, you really using empathy when auditing code that you may see like, yes. wow, what, what's going on here? Um, or, yeah, how do you really bring empathy to that? How do I bring up? I didn't hear the how first part. How do you bring part. empathy to those code audits that are sometimes <laughs> difficult to navigate? Um, I mean, it's all in the attitude and remembering that you've done it before. Because if you can identify that the code isn't up to par, that means you've been able to level up to where it is up to par. And that means you've been there before. Um, and I think if you've been there before, you can have that empathy. Um, you don't want to shame, you don't want to make public um, accusations, you don't want to laugh, like be factual and say it kindly. And I mean, I think that's, that's the best advice I could give. Yeah. I did, <clears throat> I did accessibility incorporate into this mm. big site. You mentioned adding a tag for all text, but it, a thousand pages is a lot to audit. A thousand pages is a lot to audit. Um, we use tools to do that, and Aaron spent a great deal of time going through all of the errors that the tools um, reported. One page at a time? In some cases, one page at a time. I remember what percent. We, it was a... Was yeah. it 25% of the pages, maybe? I, I don't I remember. Look, I bet I can find it. <laughs> yeah. So sort of a combination of one by one, see what the trends are, use a tool, and then put systems in place that can rectify some of the things. Like we, I think the biggest mistake you can make is expect that you're going to be 100% effective immediately, right away. Like, this is iterative. We'll run the tools, we'll put in some things, we'll run it again, and we'll try again. I think it's about a 10% of the pages. 10%? Do you happen to know how many pages? Because that will an yeah. answer that question. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was 97 pages that were tested as a part of the audit. So over 1,000 pages of the site, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Any final questions? Yes. So you mentioned that everything was kind of jammed into one content type, yeah. but things were still like kind of templatized. Like what did you end up with for content types after you kind of got it separated out? The only thing we've done for separating content types out right now is the news item. Oh, okay. So, and you can imagine that everything that's um, a basic page is because there was no concept of yeah. content types in the Cold Fusion site that there was before. It's just the way it is. We'll just put it all in one thing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, check back next year. <laughs> okay, cool. That's it. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, any other questions, please feel free to email me.